Welcome to Research Perch from the Massage Therapy Foundation. Short, practical insights into massage therapy research and how it can benefit your practice. Hey everyone, Michael Reynolds here and welcome back to Research Perch from the Massage Therapy Foundation. Uh, I am the marketing chair uh, for the marketing committee for the Massage Therapy Foundation and we're so happy that you're subscribed to our podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, here with Nikki Monk and Ruth Warner. Ruth, how are you? I'm terrific, Mike. How are you? Great. I always envy you out on the beautiful Oregon coast there. And Nikki, how's your day going? Doing well, thanks. Excellent. Um, so Research Perch is designed to unpack and really help um, help with some insights into articles and studies from the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work, which is located at IJTMB.org. And so we certainly hope our listeners are subscribed uh, to that journal online. It's free. So. Um, Today's article, um, I think, is uh, fairly significant. I'm really interested specifically because it addresses chronic low back pain, which, I mean, how many clients see their massage therapist for chronic low back pain? Probably a gazillion, right? So uh, the specific title here is, is titled Better or Worse, a study of day-to-day -day changes over five months of Rosen Method Bodywork Treatment for Chronic Low Back Pain. So it's a very long title, kind of a mouthful, uh, but very specific and descriptive, I think. Um, so... First off, uh, just help me out here. Uh, Ruth, could you tell us what Rosen Method is? Um, no. You cannot? I, <laughs> I mean, I, I uh, have received one session of Rosen work, um, and that was several years ago. I can tell you how the author describes it. This author is uh, named okay. um, uh, Dr. Alan Fogel, and um, he is, at least at the time of publication, was based out of the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And he describes the Rosen work uh, massage Rosen work method body work um, as being a combination of, of touch and sort of keywords um, and the purpose of it is for enhancing embodied self-awareness um, it's uh, it's an interesting idea and one of the um, one of the places where I felt some tension about this study was about was in scope of practice issues because we have to be quite careful about delineating between what is body work and what is, you know, body work or massage therapy versus talk therapy. Um, and in Rosen work, there, talk is part of the approach, although this author does delineate very clearly that um, within this, there is no agenda he, to, to fix, and he puts uh, quotation marks around that, but simply to observe. Um, and maybe more than anything, to help the client to observe. Uh, and, and that sense, that, that field of, mindful, of body mindfulness um, is a really interesting um, uh, field of study right now. And so for me, um, that's how I'm sort of categorizing Rosen work in my head is as a, as a method to help people learn their bodies better. Okay, so this might be a quick tangent, but what is the value in observing? Well, for instance, um, and this actually speaks to a blog that went up today um, uh, on the Foundation's website, um, people who struggle with certain kinds of problems, and you know, really stress and anxiety and all of its manifestations are among these, um, tend to do better, tend to manage their conditions better, if they become more self-aware about when they are building tension. So, you know, if, if you're not aware when you're gritting your teeth and then you become aware of it and you can take a breath and relax. If you're not aware when your gut is in nuts, is, is in knots rather, sort of like mine right now, um, and, then you <laughs> and then you become aware of it and you take a breath and relax. Um, these are these are self-regulation methods, aren't they, for helping us manage our physical state. But for people who are a little bit turned tuned off or tuned out to what's happening with them physically, it's you know it's it it makes no sense for them to ask them to do that because they don't have the skill of listening to how their body feels. Okay, that that makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate the explanation. Um, and I, I'm I'm actually kind of interested in this concept of mindfulness because um, probably because I just read the book Ten Percent Happier. It's on meditation, so I'm uh, kind of 
exploring a little bit more about mindfulness and meditation. So I appreciate that. So, um, well, certainly, and it's yeah, certainly a topic that's really important in chronic low back pain as well. I mean, there's especially when you're starting when you consider non-specific chronic low back pain um, that there's really it's unspecified. We don't necessarily know what it's coming from, and oftentimes it is going around this idea that people are having this unconscious holding. And so being able to bring people's awareness up is, is, a, is a pretty logical approach and has been shown in, in, in other areas to be very beneficial. So this is a particular method, the Rosen method body work, um, we're using to approach that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and specifically this, um, this particular article does address chronic low back pain. And you mentioned earlier that there are some you know, really good things about this uh, particular study, some challenging things you notice, or kind of interesting points you want to make about it. So tell us what's going on here. All right, so quickly, the, intention, the, the, the premise of this work is that they, uh, Dr. Allen or um, Dr. Fogel, Fogel discussed the um, chronic low back pain and the, the issues, the general issues around that, the, um, oh, I think the storm has gotten here now, Michael. I, just, I got <laughs> the a little storm bit, has reached you. I think so. I got a little bit of a brownout, so hopefully we won't lose me. Um, <laughs> but the premise was that there's there's a lot of variability in um, um, symptomology and pain and fatigue, and and, and and that happens day to day. So within even a course of treatments, and the intention of this study in particular was to document report and discuss the day-to-day -day variability in the perception of physical sensation, emotional state, um, in this sample, this very specific sample of five individuals with chronic low back pain. They received 16 total treatments of this Rosen method body work. They were provided weekly, so it was about a five-month duration. The study used um, a new design, uh, to me, it was um, microgenetic design, which specifies frequent observations over an extended period of time and in a small number of studies. So through the use of journals, the participants reported daily assessment of pain, fatigue, emotional state, and sense of control during this uh, five-month study period. And they actually had uh, pretty good compliance to that. I don't think anybody missed more than 13% of um, their reportings in that. Uh, in addition, the participants completed the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire, which measures pain and disability in other, and they also answered other questions related to perceived changes in their back pain and work-related changes with the chronic low back pain before they started the course of treatments, and then again after they started uh, finished this course of treatments. They had several different hypotheses, um, one of which was that um, the pre and post scores on those the role, the Roland Morris Disability Index would uh, improve and that also they would have reduction in work disability and pain, um, which they showed in their uh, five samples. That, and note too that with when you have such small sample sizes like this, there wasn't statistically meaningful um, differences and you can't measure that in, in, in something quite like this. Um, they were also interested in showing the the big fluctuations that happen in treatments and in fact for those of for those of you who are watching the podcast I'll actually show you um, oh one of the figures that they provided and for those of you who are listening let's see let's see how this if this works hmm. yeah we can see it I mean we it looks like that. a yeah, so basically, it looks like it. It almost looks like um, a heart rate monitor or something, or or oh Richter no, scale. Uh, yeah, Richter scale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And basically, it's all the different points. And this is over. This particular um, participant was 156 days, and so while there's a trend that goes down, which is which is positive, the daily fluctuations are, are up and down and up and down, um, which just which the, the takeaway for that could could certainly be for um, for clients who are coming to receive body work, whether it be Rosen method or or what have you, is that there is variability that happens during a course of treatment. What you want to, rather than focusing on sort of the the day to day changes, looking at the overall course of the work might be more meaningful. Um, I think. And we could we could talk about some of the other challenges, but I think talking on that point first, what 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 practitioners can take away from this study would be good. Okay, 
Great, I appreciate that, Nikki. Um, let me take a quick break before we get to some of those other challenges because I do want to highlight our sponsor today, which is uh, Anatomy in Motion. Uh, we're really happy to have Anatomy in Motion sponsoring this podcast today. Uh, if you're not familiar with Anatomy in Motion, it is the reason Ruth bought an iPad. So there's your, <laughs> one of your strongest endorsements. Uh, it is an absolutely gorgeous app, and it's for massage therapists, it's for athletes, coaches, doctors, medical students, physical trainers, anyone that works with the human body, honestly. And it is in the iOS App Store. It's available for iPad and iPhone currently. Um, and it is well worth the download. It uh, basically is, it allows you to learn the muscle systems of the body, and it's really an educational app focused on the study of muscles. Um, so be sure and check it out. It, again, I cannot stress how beautiful this app is, how well done uh, it is, just how well put together it is. Uh, check them out on Facebook as well. Uh, if you search Facebook for Anatomy in Motion, you'll see a thriving community of people who love the app and who interact with uh, the Facebook page and share information. Um, so again, go to the I iTunes store. Uh, it's for iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch. It's called Anatomy in Motion. Uh, check it out. We'd really appreciate you uh, taking a look at uh, that app and showing some love to our sponsor. So we appreciate that. Thanks, Anatomy in Motion. Um, yay! Yay! So, um, Nikki, you were mentioning that um, there are some, some interesting things, maybe some challenges and things about this study that you wanted to point out as well. Anything else that, um, that kind of jumps out at you? Well, so... First of all, um, one of the things that this study does not do is test the efficacy or, or effectiveness of, um, of the Rosen method on chronic low back pain. In order to do that, you would have to have a control group and they, well, larger sample sizes and a control group something or something to compare it to, and they, and they don't. They um, are using um, inter-client uh, sort of measurements and seeing really more of a descriptive study of how these particular people responded. Um, one of the things that I thought was really kind of interesting was how very precise they were on the folks that they were recruiting. In fact, in their um, recruitment materials, they very much specified that they wanted female volunteers between the ages of 25 and 55, so a really nice age range, certainly, who are motivated to overcome chronic low back pain they may qualify to participate in a research study involving an, investiga an investigation of Rosen method bodywork, and the, they would be compensated. Um, and then from the people who called in, they selected um, the folks who would participate. So they were really wanting to target people who were very much motivated, who would definitely respond if there was a response. And I think in an earlier podcast, um, when we were talking about Dr. Marashka's work, work, we were talking about um, expectation and belief and how um, how invested somebody is in, in, a, in a treatment and its benefits. And the more invested or the higher the belief, the better the outcomes are, are likely to be. And I think it's an interesting point to note that three of the five people that they followed in this study were actually former body workers. Yeah. So these folks are primed for a good benefit and a good effect. Yeah, talk so, about an ideal sample size or a sample <laughs> that's pretty pretty much <laughs> ideal, right? <laughs> right, right. And I think and I think that, that particularly with this kind of work, I think that it's that hinders the generalizability even more of the results of this study, even than uh, such a small sample size of five. I think the generalizability? that generalizability? Yes. Yes. The general so generalizability is the extent to which you can apply findings to larger okay. populations. Got it. So it's so specific and so Handpicked, basically. Right, right. So, you know, I would I would say that the next step would be to really establish efficacy in more of a controlled, systematic way. They do a lot of things. There's there's this tension between um, uh, study designs between more explanatory methodology and more pragmatic. Explanatory being efficacy testing um, type designs and pragmatic being more effectiveness, so how things respond in the real world, how it's actually practiced. So, and, yeah. I'd like to interject here for Michael to, to, to emphasize again the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. It took yes. me months, it took me forever <laughs> to figure out what the difference is between these two things. Yeah, help me with that now, one. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna save you guys months of tourists on this. So. <laughs> So uh, um, uh, an efficacy study 
tries to create a, a situation in which you have the best possible chance of having a positive outcome or having the outcome that you're looking for. All right? Um, and so, for instance, in drug trials, an efficacy study selects a population and, and, and uh, makes sure they're not doing other interventions that might interfere with their drugs and, and whatever. Um, and that's, it, 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 that's pretty easy to control because you can tr control the dosage of the drug and things like that. Um, that's harder to do for massage therapy because there's so much uh, variability for what's the very best thing from one person to another. Um, but an effectiveness study is one that looks at how an intervention works in, as Nikki said, in the real world. Um, and when we look at studies for massage, very often the efficacy studies are problematic, and the effectiveness studies show a pretty strong uh, show a pretty strong result. In this study, it seemed like they were really looking for the best of both worlds by choosing clients who were going to, you know, most likely to have the very best um, outcome. Uh, while looking at uh, the body work in a real world setting over you know, once a week for five months, that's a pretty nice, nice um, um, parameter to have to study. Have to study. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, I appreciate that because that, I, I would have probably spent months trying to figure out the difference. So <laughs> thank you for clarifying efficacy versus effectiveness. It sounds like it's kind of, would I be correct in thinking it's kind of a spectrum of um, I mean, they're obviously related, but it looks like kind of a spectrum. You can probably, like you said, have the best of both worlds sometimes, or I would say a continuum. Actually, a continuum? okay. And by, and by, that makes more sense. by you talking about this too, it's a really appropriate time to bring up actually another article that that wasn't published in even in our field, but it's by um, uh, Kevin Thorpe and colleagues, and they talk about this very thing, and they are they developed a. I think we uh, lost Nikki. I think Nikki lost power. Oh. All Darn. right. Well, she was about to make an amazing point, I'm sure. So, um, Ruth, uh, w would you be able to read her mind and figure out what she was about to tell us? <laughs> I am writing down Thorpe and colleagues because I am. <laughs> All I right. Know what this well, says. Um, that is, those are the perils of uh, doing podcasts via Google Hangouts. Sometimes one of us loses power. So, for those who are listening, uh, Nikki and I are both in Indianapolis, and I just. Uh, narrowly missed a storm, and apparently it hit Nikki downtown, which is uh, a little further away from me. So, uh, Nikki, we, we lost Nikki for the moment, uh, so she will be back. Um, so, Ruth, you and I will just kind of wrap this up if that's all right. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to, I, we're about out of time anyway, so this is a good time to wrap up. But I just want to really uh, make sure I understand our conclusions here. So, um, what I'm getting from this particular study is that, uh, like you said, the conditions are really set up favorably to do everything possible to really get the result we're expecting. So it's not necessarily discounting the result, but we have to understand that things are set up to be very favorable. Um, and really what it's saying is um, people did report decrease in pain and positive outcomes um, with Rosen method uh, being and, applied and with here. those fluctuations over time. Right, right. There was some yeah. fluctuations up and down, uh, a lot of factors at play here. and. And this concept of mindfulness comes into play as well to tell us that, you know, there's obviously more than one factor at play here. The 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 types of people that are participating in the study, obviously they're body workers, and when you're more mindful of your own body and your healing process, that can also play a part in the outcomes as well. Would that be fair to say? Um, it's not a conclusion that that the authors come to, but it's one that, um, you know, that that. I certainly find supported by this by this study among among many others. Um, okay. Okay. There was another point I wanted to make here. I mean, there there are a lot of places where I kind of scratched my head at this study, like not having a control. But that's not what they you know that's not what they chose to do. So so fine. But I have never seen I've never read a study that really looked at long term implications over five months. Um, tracking those fluctuations to see if, as we intuit, people do in fact improve over time even with those even with those good days and bad days in between. Um, so, you know, I don't, as, as Nikki said, I don't know that this is generalizable. This is a little bit like those weight loss commercials where they show the, the really skinny person and say results not typical. 
right? But <laughs> right. for some people, this seems to work really, really, really well. Um, and I would be hopeful that Dr. Fogel might follow this up with another study where, where we really do have a, a more randomized population and a control group so we can, control, we can compare the Rosen method body work to either no intervention or some kind of intervention for chronic low back pain. Yeah, it sounds like it merits further research. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, it sounds like, uh, again, if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like for massage therapists who maybe they're, um, they're experienced in Rosen method or would like to explore it, it sounds like there is um, possibility that it can provide or can help with positive outcomes uh, when working with chronic low back pain. Obviously not definitive, but there's some indications that they might want to explore this further. Would that be fair to say? That's fair to say. And another takeaway from this is, is that time span issue that, you know, while you had a bad day yesterday, you know, we have some research that indicates over time, really things get better. Yeah, look at the big picture. Absolutely. Right. Right. All right. Well, Ruth, thank you so much. I, I, uh, I feel, wish Nikki were able to, to stay with us, but hopefully uh, she'll regain power. Uh, oh, Nikki's back. Oh, back. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's, Nikki, welcome back. We, we are just wrapping up. Uh, Ruth actually uh, kind of picked up where you lost power and left us, so we're just wrapping up. Uh, so you can help us say, uh, say thank you and uh, sign off here. So, uh, Nikki, Ruth, thank you so much for joining us today. And for our listeners and viewers, thank you so much. We appreciate you subscribing. Um, if you are watching, consider subscribing via your mobile device on iTunes or Stitcher. Links are below this video. If you're listening, uh, please keep on listening and consider subscribing to our blog. And especially to the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Bodywork, which is at IJTMB.org, and that's the resource that we uh, take these articles from, and we unpack them for you. So there's a lot more there. Uh, be sure and look up this particular article. It is um, <clears throat> excuse me, by Alan Fogel, so just search for Fogel. Uh, I'm sure you'll find it there on IJTMB.org. Nikki, Ruth, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Research Perch. Please send feedback or questions to perch at massagetherapyfoundation.org. See you next time.